won that game. So now it's time for revenge for the world champion. Yeah. David, is that what it is about for Magnus Carlsen in this game? Revenge against Eric Hansen? It's definitely about revenge. Magnus, as we mentioned, he bears grudges. He remembers every defeat he's ever uh, <laughs> been inflicted on, and he wants to win against that opponent to show who is the boss. And last time in the Air Things Masters, we actually saw uh, Magnus again with white. There he opened with his king's pawn, 1e4. He's gone away from that, and now he's opened with the English opening. And uh, okay, Eric, maybe not expecting this. How will he react in the opening? Eric, great player, of course, did great in the Air Things Masters, but he is known to suffer from time trouble. He's very slow in certain positions, and uh, maybe Magnus just wants to give him a lot of choice at this early stage. Uh, Eric deciding upon what to play and just occupying the center with a pawn. This is what we call the Four Knights variation. <laughs> and Magnus just, ah. again, pushing a pawn to Fianchetto, his bishop. Oh, wow, that is very nice. I don't, that's that's with the knights. I, I, new to me, I think, at this level, to see those Four Knights out there. Yeah, um, there are various different types of Four Knights openings. There's one in King's Pawn openings. Um, this is one of them. But yeah, it's, it's not necessarily the most common uh, variation. And that's why Magnus has chosen it, I think. He just wants Eric to be thinking for himself at an early stage. If we rewind one month when Eric beat Magnus, that was a really theoretical battle. I think Eric was able to get the first 15, 20 moves down on the board almost instantly. And uh, later he was able to calculate his way to trick Magnus and uh, eventually win the game. So Magnus just maybe learning from that defeat, he's trying a different strategy here. They kind of look like, you know, like four like pillars <laughs> in the entrance into the position. Yeah. And oh, one of them's moved though, Kaya, no. unfortunately. <laughs> we do see a trade of pawns. And uh, now after this, white's going to castle. Black's going to get his bishop out. He's going to do the same. And um, yeah, we call this the reverse dragon. Uh, there's lots of different names. What a cool game already. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is actually a Sicilian defense now, just with reverse colors. And it would be the dragon variation of the Sicilian. I'm not sure why it's called the dragon, maybe because it breathes fire. But um, either way, this is still well known theoretically. I remember a win by Magnus Carlsen in 2009 against Vladimir Kramnik in this opening. He's got fond memories. So, uh, yeah, he's just hoping to outplay Eric. So just the name of the opening is? Uh, the Reversed Dragon Sicilian. The reverse, so yeah. I'm, this is the opening that I'm going to study. I love it already. <laughs> it Super sounds, cool. Sounds I used to ferocious. play this. Yeah. I used to, I used play, to it play this variation, actually. But, but, but for, for Blitz yeah. games, I was moving my knight uh, not to, be, to uh, this side, to e6. the queen side, to b6, but I was moving it uh, to e7, let's okay. say, it, where the bishop is standing now. So a different branch, maybe, yes. this opening. Yes, uh, I had some tricks there, and uh, was, I, I played it quite successfully uh, in, in Blitz games. You no, even I remember against Motilov. Okay. <laughs> so some, okay. some good funny memories. I was also just uh, seriously impressed by David plucking out a game from over 13 years ago and saying, yes. hey, this is between Magnus Carlsen and, and uh, Vladimir Kramnik. And check my database. Lo and behold, 2009, London Classic. In, yeah, I mean, I it might sound there. impressive, but I was sitting next to them on the stage. <laughs> so I remember. Because you were playing? I was playing yeah, in those days. Okay, uh, so you were playing and you remember the game going on next to you. Uh, Not impressive at all, David. <laughs> <laughs> that's only because I think maybe it was my best ever result. I came third in the tournament behind Carlson and Kramnik. So, ah, nice. Um, yeah, those were the glory days. <laughs> <laughs> you, have the, you do have quite a few good results in London. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. No, Kaya, I was also impressed today when you said the game number six of the match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm actually kind of you proud of it, yeah. Some habits, yeah, I think you, you take them also. <laughs> but I think, so I remember game six is because we talked a lot about game six. That's when the drama starts to happen in the World Championship matches. Yeah, historically, mm -hmm. I think there's been a kind of disproportionate number of decisive results, right, in game six. If you go back to the 19th century, already many uh, World Championship matches decided. Uh, yeah. by those kind of critical moments in the middle of the match. So It was a pity I just left Dubai at this moment and oh, <laughs> the sixth no, game came. <laughs> yes, and I was given a short, short interview to Chess24 um, with Askill. And, uh, and actually, um, 
they ask my opinion and they said it, it's going to be a, the, the five, six game should be one of the most important games of the match. <laughs> <laughs> and then I left. Oh, yes, it was such a yeah. pity. <laughs> it changed the whole momentum of the match. I mean, that was yeah. quite interesting because before that, I think David and myself had both uh, had uh, requests from the BBC and Newsnight to kind of appear on their shows and discuss how compu computers were just ruining the game and the players were playing too perfectly and there was just no margin for actual chess and for human error. Mm. And lo and behold, game six happened <laughs> and the gates opened and uh, we saw Napomni actually collapse. And actually yep. we saw Magnus uh, uh, use a very human approach to avoid all this computer preparation. Uh -huh. So everything that, that you know had been said before, <laughs> well, we was quickly forgotten. <laughs> yeah. He is known for that, right, Magnus Carlsen, the human approach to the game. Exactly. Um, he's... I think one of the biggest students of the game, he studied all the former world champions. He would have been aware that game six is kind of a historical match. And mm. just in, in terms of general chess style as well, he picks up little tips here and there. He knows how to put psychological pressure on his opponents. And OK, meanwhile, getting back to this game, it has differed from that Carlsen against Kramnik game that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but White has started pushing pawns, trying to gain space on the queen side, on this left side of the board. Uh, Black just organising his pieces. It looks like Black's been retreating a bit, especially the Black Dark Squad Bishop going back next to his king. But this is very common uh, type of technique. And now Magnus jump forward with the White Bishop, attacking the White, uh, attacking the Black Queen. Uh, we saw that blocked, and it's really interesting. Magnus actually just gave up a move with this Bishop maneuver. He jumped forward, allowed Black to gain time by blocking, and then retreated. He's hoping that the Black King is vulnerable on this light square diagonal. If we look at the White, at the Black King on the White squares, some loose. Uh, some possibility maybe of an attack later in the game. So, okay, Eric, meanwhile, reacting very quickly, pushing a pawn, trying to force White to commit on this queen side. Do you step forward with Mag uh, if you're Magnus? Do you trade a set of pawns? I'm expecting to see him step forward with a pawn here, but then Eric's going to jump into the centre with a black knight, and this is still very thematic. Both players clearly have studied something similar to this before. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to mention something that uh, Magnus's uh, bishop manoeuvre, actually attacking the queen, provoking that pawn weakness, has been played before, but wasn't the most popular line, actually. And uh, this is something that we've seen from Magnus time and time again. He goes into these main lines and then picks a sideline and takes his opponent into these, these kind of uh, unfamiliar territories. Yeah, he did this in the World Championship match, mm. right? He went into the main lines, but then chose the fifth most popular move. So it's unlikely the opponent would have studied that. Then the next game, he'll choose the fourth most popular move. <laughs> and he just confuses his opponents because they've studied something very similar, but not exactly that. And that's how he's able to kind of stay unpredictable, uh, just dancing around in the opening. So um, earlier we had this question, right? Like, should you focus on studying the openings? But there are special kind of special time consuming or time efficient ways, sorry. Uh, to study the openings where you can surprise your opponents and it can be really effective. Mm. Meanwhile, though, Eric doing a great job of staying up on the clock because that has been his Achilles heel, uh, his only weakness really okay. in the Athings Masters last month. 15 minutes left on the clock and we see Eric sitting there with his uh, sweater with the chess bra logo. He is a known, a big, big chess streamer, as most of you probably know. And a move. Two moves. Yeah, wow. Really committal as well from Magnus Carlsen. So he's traded off White's dark square bishop, which tends to be quite a good piece, actually, in these positions. He's traded off for a knight, but look at Black's pawns over there on the B file. Black has two double pawns over there. And uh, Magnus is going to hope he's going to play the long game. He's going to hope that's a, a strategic weakness later on. But Black does have the bishop pair, so this is really, really uh, complex now. I'm not sure who I prefer in these types of positions. Uh, White has a great light square bishop to compensate for uh, maybe his lack of fight on the dark squares later on. But then again, uh, if Black can get organised, if Black can get all his pieces off the back rank at some point, then Eric will be happy. And Eric's bobbing his head. He looks confident. Yeah. All right. Well, and he has a lot of time on the clock. Now, are you a big fan of chess streaming? Anastasia, do you watch it a lot? I don't. I don't watch it a lot, but of course I'm following from time to time. Yeah. Uh, of course, I, I know the names of the <laughs> most famous streamers. Yes, one, I also have my Twitch account, but I must say that I'm a bit lazy, you know, <laughs> person. <laughs> and uh, so I, I appear from time to time uh, for commentaries on different websites, uh, and you know, also sometimes traveling to, for chess events. So, but streaming, yes, it's it's cool, and we all know that uh, Eric Hansen is a really popular and good streamer. Yeah. This 
these days. And uh, still, is, he's able to, to fight on, on the very decent level, which is mm. great. Yeah, isn't that impressive? It's basically a full-time job for him, right? To be a chess streamer, yeah. to be here with the best players in the world, competing uh, at the very top. Yes, uh, I, I agree. And uh, when I think of chess bar, I'm always reminded of the time when I first moved into my house and we didn't have any internet. So my husband sorted out some kind of, I don't know, satellite okay. broadband where we had a fixed capacity. And he thought that he'd bought a lot, except I went on chess bar <laughs> and I watched their streams. And I think two days later, my husband was like, well, hang on a second. <laughs> No more internet. No more internet. What happened there? <laughs> and I was like, oh, does streaming take up that much uh, internet? And he goes, yeah, okay, yeah. So I, <laughs> I tell this story to Eric and he goes, yeah, sorry, sorry, I ate up your ball back. <laughs> so you stopped watching yeah. the streams after yeah. that. I did. It was very enjoyable. Mm. Meanwhile, we've seen a huge move by Magnus Carlsen because he sacrificed a pawn and it's not 100% clear what his plan is if Eric doesn't trust him and takes it, but okay, Eric did not call the bluff. Uh, Magnus, I think he had a special idea up his sleeve and I just have to show this because it's so beautiful. Uh, here in this position, Magnus has just brought his knight back, actually blocking the queen's connection to this pawn in front of it. And now black could have got greedy and could have captured this pawn. And I was trying to work out there, just uh, while you were discussing chess bra, I was trying to work out what the idea was. But maybe the idea is actually to bring the white knight forward to this square and Black's Queen actually has a selection of knights to capture here. If we see a trade of queens, yes, white's a pawn down, but white is doing well because there are weaknesses to attack. But no matter which knight the Black Queen captured, it would have got trapped. If you take this knight, the Black Queen is trapped here. There's no escape squares and you lose the queen. If you took the other knight, then suddenly a fork and a double attack. This is just beautiful. I've ne nearly never seen this type of pattern before in my life. So Magnus Carlsen there setting a trap, but Eric didn't fall into it. I'm just curious whether Eric saw it, or whether he uh, just trusted Magnus and uh, didn't even want to calculate, didn't even want to waste time working out the consequences there. Instead, he brought his rook across and White's knight has indeed jumped over. And just to kind of sum up the position here, remember, White has a better pawn structure. Black's pawns here are doubled, they're ugly, they're weak, but Black has the bishop pair. So these two bishops are the kind of the soul of Black's position. If Black can develop these pieces, for example, the bishop coming out now, and maybe even developing his bishop out later in the game, this guy out, can come out to a decent square. If he can do that, Eric's doing well, but if not, Magnus has weaknesses to probe at, and he loves those types of things. Uh, okay, the bishop has indeed come out to cover the light squares around the Black King. That's a good start. Uh, so it's all about the bishops and whether White can prove that these are weaknesses. Magnus is going for them. He's brought his knight to the side of the board double attack now against this pawn. And uh, it's just a really complex positional strategic fight. Eric dropping back with his knight. He's counterattacking against the white pawns now. And uh, Eric, I've nev never seen him play this fast, I must admit. Wow. This uh, is a clear strategy from him. He's clearly learned his lesson from the last tournament where time did eventually see him uh, time struggles eventually saw him eliminated in the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, was it possible to take this knight on, uh, which was actually uh, threatening yeah. the pawn on b6? I mean, yeah, instead of C4 moving the knight. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it, yeah, I think it would have been possible for Black's light square bishop to go and capture a knight, but maybe he was just worried about heading towards an endgame and Magnus is a specialist there. Uh, Eric maybe just trying to keep more tension in the position. I mean, I say I'm impressed that he's playing so fast. I'm just surprised <laughs> uh, because some huge decisions for him. As you mentioned, yes. Anastasia, he had options, many options on every turn. But Eric is just ramping up the speed. Yeah. And uh, now when it comes to Eric increasing his pace, I'm kind of reminded of an article that I think I read in the Newer Chess uh, magazine where he talks about his experiences in his debut, the US AIM Chess Rapid last season. And there he just said that he was too slow. Mm. And he got all these promising positions and he just kept squandering them with one move blunders. And so he promised himself in the second debut that in uh, the Air Things Masters, he was not going to be doing that. But he still found himself in time trouble. And so I think now it's like, OK, I'm going to learn my lesson and I'm going to play as confidently as I can. Yeah, it must have been a confidence boost for him to do so well mm. in the last tournament, to beating Magnus and getting through to the knockouts. Um, OK, meanwhile, a set of pawns have been exchanged on this left side of the board, on the queen side. And uh, in general, if we just stop calculating, this should favour black because black has traded off a very strong white pawn for one of black's doubled pawns. But then again, black's knight is undefended temporarily. White's knights look very nice. 
Um, you can imagine the white queen jumping out, gaining a bit of time. Okay, she has done this, attacking the black knight and the pawn next to it. Um, so it's become a bit more concrete. Uh, it is about calculation now, and I know Eric has played fast and we've been praising him for it, but he needs to slow down around now because things are getting a bit critical. If you're too passive with black, you might just lose a pawn and not get any compensation for it. So now is the time, now is a really critical moment. Invest three or four minutes, try and work out what's happening over the next few moves. And That's a great advice, actually, from you, David. You know, it's very important to feel the moment when you really need to spend time. I think uh, many players, you used, I mean, in the internet, also used to play one-minute games, like yeah. three-minute <laughs> games, and, uh, and like nobody's used to think properly uh, about something which is really important. I mean, we have some critical moments in every game, and it's really important to go through different variations and find the best way uh, how to continue. So, of course, uh, such a good player as Eric Hansen knows it, knows it, and. Uh, he will definitely spend some time, uh, but uh, I mean, it can. It, I mean, this is very time. Time management is a very important skill. skill. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Definitely. And um, I, you go. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that I actually checked the computer to see whether you know uh, Eric was actually walking a tightrope, and he is. There's actually only one good uh, knight move, and that's actually to go forward with the knight. To okay. jump into white's half. Exactly. Wow, that's brave. Um, that is brave, because my instinct was actually just to step backwards with the, white, with the black knight, challenge the, its counterpart. Same. Um, the, so the most natural move may be going back with the black knight, at least the safest, most logical move. It's yeah. a mistake. It is a mistake. Wow, OK. And yeah, actually, you mentioned that time management there, Anastasia, and. I think especially for streamers, that's why it's so impressive that Eric's done well uh, when he's come back to longer forms of chess and against the best in the world, because streamers mostly play blitz, they mostly play bullet. Um, it's hard to get a rhythm once you have more time uh, to think. And um, yeah, he's been mightily impressive. And I think that's why, okay, I joke about my time management, lots of people joke about it, but I do spend a lot of time in order to kind of formulate a long-term plan. It's, I try to pick the critical moments and that's what the top players do. From practice, from learning, uh, kind of studying, they realize when to spend their time. Mm. I, ha I have a question for you, David, because I was uh, watching uh, your games uh, <laughs> and uh, you and Niels would often settle into very long things. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask, how did you maintain your concentration? Because, you know, how did you kind of not, not spend like five minutes and then your brain goes, how about this tune or something? How did you just focus? Um, Do you have any tips there? I'm not sure I was that focused. Uh, <laughs> I mean, most of the time I was able to think and most of the time my moves were okay after those long things, but there was one case where I spent nearly 40 minutes and I came up with the wrong plan and I kind of didn't trust my first instinct. So um, there are pros and cons definitely, but I guess it helped that we were in this grand library, yeah. uh, this amazing venue, and there was literally nothing else apart from a chessboard. <laughs> so you had to focus. Yeah. And uh, I also make a rule of never listening to music before games or on the day of games, just because I don't want anything yeah. in my head apart from the chess. So. And do you structure your thoughts? Like, for instance, first of all, you start off with a bigger picture and then you're like, OK, these are the moves I need to calculate. Or does your mind, <laughs> oh, that's like my mind, mind and <laughs> is a bit chaotic, jumps here and then suddenly there might be this eureka moment where I'm like, woohoo, well, hang on a second, there's this. <laughs> I must admit, before I started commentary work, it was just a mess in my head. <laughs> but uh, ever since I started commentating, I do occasionally take a step back and talk to myself. And actually, especially when I'm in time trouble, I take a step back and thinking, I think, OK, my opponent's going to play this, this or this. OK, I have a forced move against this one. I don't have to worry about that one. I have a forced move here. This one I need to calculate, so I'll focus on this one. And it's just, it's easier to structure now. I can take a step back. But uh, yeah, instincts are rusty, but I think the logical thinking is improved. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So, if you want to improve in chess, you have to become a commentator. Uh, now I know yeah. the trick. <laughs> um, that's why we're so good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <us here. laughs> and uh, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, send us your selfies, you know, just get enthusiastic about the actual chess that's happening, then don't forget you can tweet us using the hashtag. Chess, ch ooh, chess champs. I, yeah. I needed to catch my breath. There. <laughs> it's a little bit of a long sentence. And uh, yeah, we will try and feature them on the show. Definitely. Hashtag chess champs on Twitter, the way to reach us. And also the auction for David's chess tie. Only 40 minutes left now. Exactly 40 minutes to go to make your bid for the lucky chess tie and the current bid $450. Oh. That's impressive. Yeah, impressive. I'm almost yeah. speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it's touching, isn't it? That yeah. uh, 
people support the show that much that they're able and willing to buy a chess tie, yeah. buy the, the chess auctions, and also to support the cause. And it, it really is like you were mentioning, Anastasia, you know, that everyone is coming together, helping out, yep. and uh, being part of this big, wonderful community. Mm. Absolutely. This uh, tournament is all about uh, Charity Cup and donating to UNICEF, who is uh, doing life-saving work in and around Ukraine for the children and their families in need there. So, uh, yeah, keep donating. We're so much appreciating every single dollar you're contributing with. And we're also allowing ourselves to be entertained by the chess in this tournament. Magnus Carlsen out for revenge against Eric Hansen here. Eric, for the very first time in his life, was able to win against Magnus Carlsen in a tournament in the Air Things Masters. I have to say, Magnus is looking uh, focused. He is not going to lose this game. Yeah, he's looking confident as well. Just yeah. body language. He thinks, OK, White has control. Remember, White has a couple of threats. White is hitting the Black Knight with the White Queen, but the White Queen is also attacking the pawn in front of it. And uh, also, as Ivanka revealed, there's only really one move for Black to stay in this game, to keep things uh, balanced. And it's not an easy one. It's not an obvious one. Eric's done the right thing. He's paused now. He's realised it is a critical moment, that uh, kind of the path has narrowed. The stakes are higher than ever. He I finds the best move, though. Um, so that's... Yeah, I mean, uh, that's mightily impressive. He paused at the right moment. And the whole idea is that if White's Queen went up and grabbed a pawn, Black's Queen would have been able to come down and take a pawn as well. So White's Queen was forced to retreat. And now the Black Knight also stepping back. But the Black Knight, it's done a bit of a dance. It's found, it safe, uh, it's found itself on a safe square, just offering some exchanges. Mm. And yeah, OK, White has an advantage here, according to the evaluation bar, but it's not easy, at least for Magnus. And uh, Eric's done a good job of staying in the game. And, OK, Magnus, Just, I just want to point out, really nice move, improving the white rooks. They were doing nothing, and now he's defending his knights with his rooks. All of the pieces entering the action, and, OK, surprised by Eric Hansen, just taking the time out to shuffle his king to the corner. Maybe he'd seen this position in advance, actually, when he was having that longer think a few moves ago. Mm -hmm. The black king much safer on a dark square in the corner, but then again, long term, it could get trapped there. There could be some back rank checks. Uh, yeah. It is also costing one valuable move, so pros and cons to that one. Yeah, and I'm also thinking, should the game reach an end game, which is what Magnus is famous for, that king in the corner, that was going to take a bit of a time and journey to get back into the game. I was also thinking maybe he, is, um, he just uh, gives a chance for the bishop to go to the same square where the king was okay. before. Maybe in some ah. situations, <laughs> maybe this idea also he had in mind. If he will, will try to find some useful moves, maybe this move would be one of them. Because Magnus improves his position and Black has to do something. Um, so maybe he can remove his bishop at a certain point. Yeah, maybe we can show this idea, uh, Anastasia, just because uh, also um, I must admit in that match that we've been talking about quite a lot today, uh, as black, I planted my bishop on the g8 square. The first time I did it because it was the only move. And then a few games later, I did it just because I thought it would be funny to play the same move I played a few moves ago. And it was a mistake. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so as you mentioned. It's... Eric uh, saw your games and maybe it was inspired. <laughs> and... <laughs> uh, he shouldn't be inspired by this bishop retreat, uh, for example. One thing Magnus could do here, um, I'm actually expecting him maybe to make an exchange, but one thing he could do, when in doubt, remember, pick up a pawn, push it forward, um, and Black's bishop could actually step back. And the reason this is actually quite attractive for Black is because this king is super safe now. And yes, it's a retreating move, but bishops are long-range pieces. And the bishop still has influence on this diagonal, but it also gets out of the way of the Black rook on this line. It keeps the king nice and safe. And uh, yeah, maybe one idea behind his move. Um, if we go back, I mentioned I'm expecting Magnus to make a trade. I think it would take extraordinary self-control to just push a pawn and just kind of maintain the status quo. Uh, but I'm expecting just knight takes knight and a similar idea that Zhu Wenjun used in oh. the previous game, lifting the white rook up the board to the fifth rank, slightly into the black half of the board, but also eyeing up weaknesses, hitting this pawn, also trying to force black to make a decision with this bishop. Now it's attacked twice by the rook and bishop. And if we see a trade, we will see what we call a good knight against a bad bishop. And uh, this is a bad bishop because a lot of its pawns are on dark squares as well, especially its central pawns. So it's actually going to get blocked in by its own pawns. Um, and it's also got no targets. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is a really good knight because how is black ever going to remove it? Um, it's also got targets. So yeah, this does look 
slightly in White's favour. Still, bishops are good defenders, uh, even the worst bishop, even this one, as Ivanka <laughs> likes to remind me. And it, okay, Magnus, I joked about it, but he's played <laughs> the move that we've seen already in every game today. He's played h4, picked up this pawn, and <laughs> he's given his king some breathing space, instructive, but also just hinting to Eric that this pawn might destabilise the black king position later in the game. Okay, Magnus has indeed just maintained the status quo. I said this would take extraordinary self-control. Magnus is that type of player, super patient, just doing nothing, but in a useful way. And uh, that's one skill that the top players really have. Yeah, and it's really hard to, to have such a skill, <laughs> just to stay <laughs> peaceful and, and yeah. don't make your position worse than it is now. <laughs> is it a brave move by Magnus? Yeah, um, in a way, he's not really weakened himself, but at the same time, Showing that maybe he can do something later. <laughs> exactly. He's just putting the fear of ghosts into the opponent in ah. a way. Uh, so now at the back of his mind, Eric always has to just wonder about that white h-pawn pushing up the board. Um, and personally, as someone who plays a lot of blitz and a lot of uh, bullet chess online, it's so annoying when my opponent just pushes a pawn and just kind of leaves it there, just hanging. <laughs> thinking, I, every move I have to spend half a second thinking, is that pawn going to continue advancing? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, just something for Eric yeah. in the back of his mind. Wow, the psychology of chess. I know. And I also, it's also this pawn move doesn't come with too much risk because look at that chain of pawns. Uh, you want your pawns to be in chains. And uh, that sounded a bit strange. But anyway, the, <laughs> <laughs> the rook uh, is lined up with his queen. And now there's a threat in the air. Eric is threatening to play queen takes pawn. Yeah, and again, really calm by Eric. A nice move there. I think Magnus was maybe a bit too relaxed because if you look at the white knight, it looks like that white knight is dominating the black rooks. The black rooks can't use the open C file because that white knight is so strong. But the black rook now with its queen, it's eyeing up the only real weak pawn in white's position in the center there on the D file. And how do you defend that pawn with white? It's not actually easy. The white rook in the corner wants to slide across and defend it, but then there's another weakness. That white rook in the corner is guarding another pawn. Maybe Eric's caught Magnus a bit off guard here. Magnus is a bit off balance. He wants this position, but with another move, maybe his h-pawn move was just a bit too, mm -hmm. uh, too much of a luxury. Maybe a4 was better, you know, yeah. at least to remove this a3 pawn from, um, from um, being potential attack. Yes. Yeah, suddenly, Magnus, maybe he has to take a timeout with the white bishop. Okay, he puts it in the centre of the board. That oh. is provocative. I thought he maybe would drop it back next to his king, keep it safe. But now, what happens if Eric pushes a pawn to kick that bishop away? That's a good question. <laughs> like he plays really actively. Yeah, I guess. Aggressively. Interesting. After a fight, what he will do? I think he's going to block the defile with his bishop. Uh, but Magnus, he's trying to force Eric to push this pawn forward. He actually yeah. gave up a move earlier to let Eric put the, push the f-pawn forward for free. Now he's trying to do it again, but Eric pushes this pawn. Mm. Look at the black king, that's a bit loose. Ah, that is totally loose, but uh, I'm looking at that pawn move and I'm thinking this is just a, a waving a red flag to push the Harry one square forward and uh, just soften up the king side, that, that extra bit. Because uh, as David pointed out, white ha has a really nice response to black attacking the bishop with his pawn. Yeah, so if black had attacked the bishop, the white knight, uh, the white bishop, sorry, would have jumped into the middle of the board. And I still think this was maybe the lesser evil. Black could have traded a set here, and at least now black has kicked the white knight away so the black rooks can start to get active. But instead, uh, pushing this pawn, the reason I don't like this is because it is rapid chess. And again, it's the psychology, uh, it's that word psychology that Kai mentioned. This king now is slightly looser uh, just because you have pushed pawns in front of your king. And Magnus has a timeout. Maybe it's time for, to just combine all the plans we've been discussing. Anastasia mentioned this pawn being loose and a bit of a target on this diagonal. Maybe it's time to push this up one square, put everything on white squares so that the black dark square bishop has nothing to hit, a, uh, to hit on. And uh, yeah, now I think white is safe. Again, if pawn pushes forward, then you just block this file for the black queen and black rook. It's just really frustrating for black. Again, we might see a situation with good knight against a bishop that's not that great. And uh, yeah, just small advantage for Magnus, but it could be, as the evaluation bar shows, it could be the type of advantage that grows move by move now. Um, so I feel Eric's last move, a pawn push, weakening, and just a bit too slow. Yeah. Um, he needed to be a bit more concrete, a bit more aggressive, maybe attacking the opponent's bishop. And Magnus, okay, meanwhile, bring his queen to the side of the board. Um, it has after... been there already. No? Yeah, <laughs> surprising. It's been there already, as you mentioned. Uh, it was here five, six moves ago, and mm. at least he's going for a pawn. Uh, really surprising. I think Eric now has to 
push this pawn forward. Otherwise, he's just too passive. He's too late. Look at all his pieces on the back rank. You need to activate somehow. Uh, you need to just start getting aggressive and hit this bishop. Kick it away from its dream square in the middle of the board. Yeah. And uh, earlier you mentioned the word psychology. And I'm just going to ask you Daniel Nolan's questions, who asks us, do chess players at the top level ever get overconfident when playing players of lower ratings? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, normally they're good enough to control positions, but I've been there myself. I've underestimated uh, players lower rated. If they're a couple of hundred points lower, I just sometimes think, OK, if, I'm, if everything's OK, I'll, everything's on a normal day, I would beat them. But then there's no such thing as a weak player nowadays. Everyone's so good. Uh, so I've taken risks and they have backfired. Um, I know that some top players occasionally in the first round of open tournaments, it's normally top half plays bottom half. You see surprises from time mm. to time. And uh, you, norm you end up playing moves that you wouldn't normally play just because you underestimate the opponent. Yeah, so. I have a confession to make. Um, I'm going to condition my answer and say I'm ageist. So, <laughs> if, <laughs> sorry. so if my opponent is younger than me, like significantly younger, like teenager, then I will say no, I I'm don't. I, I'm never overconfident. Mm -hmm. um, when because they're, they're so fast, they're, they're fresh. Yeah, they're when they're older so than fast. me, and to say if I'm going to say 60s, uh, 50s and 60s, totally, <laughs> totally <laughs> overconfident. I think there's no way that they can beat me and I take <laughs> big risks. So, I mean, it's really the wrong approach, actually. Mm. To, but, uh, yeah, and I fall, I've fallen foul of this many times. <laughs> Oh, definitely, that's a good approach because when you see the small small kid, I mean, or young boy yeah. or girl sitting in front of you, you should worry a little yeah. bit. You, know? you never know. <laughs> and the rating sometimes doesn't really show the strengths of uh, of young, uh, let's say, generation. We can see here Pragnananda, who is only 16, and he is, uh, has similar rating with yeah. all these top players. So we shouldn't underestimate. No, chess players only because they're younger. Exactly. Actually, it's, it goes the other way around. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, but how big of a difference is 100 rating points? For example, here we have Magnus on a 2,800 uh, kind of rating. We do have um, a few players on 2,500 rating. I mean, how in 10 games, how many times will Magnus win against 2,500 rated players? Yeah, that's a good question, actually, uh, because the FIDE ratings, they have specific percentage scores that you're expected against an average ah. uh, opponent. That's how you calculate ratings. For example, um, in my recent match against Nils, we basically have the same rating. So we're expected 50% against each other. Ah. If I win a game, I get uh, kind of five rating points because I get kind of 0.5 more. Mm. Um, and Magnus against a 2,500 player, I guess he'd be expected eight. Oh, 80 something percent. Wow. Yeah. Um, so if he draws, he would lose three or four rating points. Um, but if he wins, he only gains one or two. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, if you, I think you can probably see yeah. on FIDE uh, website all these calculations. There's mm -hmm. always a specific expectant, uh, expected score. Yeah. I had a bit of a thought experiment the other day where I was thinking if someone, say, let's say, rated 1800, which is a reasonably strong player, mm -hmm. played against, uh, say, someone of David's level, 2,700, mm -hmm. and they played a 100-game game match. And assuming that they have the same kind of endurance level, could that, yeah, that yeah. 1,800 score a point, yeah. like a half a point? As soon as they had scored a half point, then the 1,800 would lose, would win. <laughs> Do you think that's possible, or is that...? It's really interesting. Maybe yeah, we need anyway. to make it happen as an experiment sometime. <laughs> the 100-game match is a bit much. <laughs> Uh, we do. I, oh, I have a dilemma actually following up on that, but just uh, this move okay. first, David. Yeah, it's actually the two moves we expected. So yeah. um, I mentioned Eric had to, uh, had to just push pawns forward. He had to take risks because sitting still, sit, being passive never helps mm. in chess, especially when you're defending. Um, and Magnus met that attack on his bishop, met that pawn push by blocking the defile with his bishop. Okay, so still very, very tense and the clocks are ticking down. So. Excitement is guaranteed in this one, I think. All right. um, a draw still far, far... Um, well, it's the un most unlikely result, I reckon, nice. here. OK, a trade of bishops, and it's that strong knight in the middle of the board against that black bishop, which doesn't look good right now, but could come to life later. All right, mm -hmm. I'll hurry up to take my dilemma then, because uh, I heard this one uh, on Norwegian radio a few years ago. Would you uh, rather be in prison for 10 years or be in prison until you have beaten Magnus Carlsen in a game of chess? Uh, I'm always optimistic, so I'm like, oh, I'm going to practice every day. One time I must be able to beat him. 
I understand that's not realistic. How uh, much of a rating would you need to have to answer that you would stay in prison until you have beaten Magnus Carlsen in chess? And you play one game per day. One game per day. I mean, uh, Anastasia, <laughs> what would you take? 10 years in prison or staying in prison until you have won one game against Magnus? Maybe 10 years would be better. <laughs> <laughs> <More> realistic. <laughs> yes. But you would be able to, right? But I mean, I think David still has chances and Joanka too. <laughs> but there would be 365 games of chess yes. and you would, you would ah, get maybe better. Maybe you will improve. Exactly. Yeah, yes. you, all you do, you're in prison, all you do is play chess, practice chess. So you'd have 3,650 games in those 10 years to <laughs> yeah. try and win one. Yep. Yes. Uh, I mean, I David, I'd, you I'd would... take my chances. Yes, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, yep. The other thing is that maybe you are ready to stay in the prison in order just to play so many games with Magnus Carlsen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> maybe he doesn't want to come to the prison. That is the answer of a chess player. <laughs> maybe at one point also he will just lose the game in order you know, to stop this challenge. <laughs> Nice. That's creative answers, thinking outside the box. Okay, well, uh, you said this game is definitely heating up, David. What's happening? Yeah, I think it was heating up a bit too much for Magnus Carlsen's liking. So he's trying to get the queens off. He's trying to head for his favorite endgame. And uh, yeah, the white queen sliding across, defending her knight, defending her rook. If the black queen trades, white would recapture. And I still think white has the better chances because white's minor piece is better, the knight superior to the bishop. Eric, though, allowing the queen exchange, but he's trying to make it happen on his terms. And right now, there is a trap. If white's queen captures the black queen, this will be recaptured by a pawn. Maybe we can show this. Mm -hmm. um, and that would actually end badly for Magnus. So Eric here, rather than playing queen takes queen, um, where this pawn supports everything, supports especially the knight in the middle of the board, this would be maybe okay for black, but still slightly better for white. Eric instead offering the queen trade, but setting a trap. And this is one thing for everyone at home to remember. Don't necessarily go for the trade unless it really helps you, unless you can do it on your ter terms, gaining time, setting traps, because now after pawn recaptures, this is a double attack, a fork. So Magnus can't actually take the queens off yet. He needs to find a clever way to do that. I'm wondering what he does here. I mean, you could maybe just move the queen away from the attack. Maybe you could move the knight forward. I don't know, it feels a bit loose. It feels like black's rooks are really coming to life. Uh, for example, after a trade here, the black rook will just move out the way. I'm not sure where. And at least black has some active pieces later in the game. So I like what Eric's doing. I think he's uh, really, uh, really dealing well with the pressure on his position. This is the current position. Magnus cannot trade queens. Magnus has to find something else. But look at the clock times as well. One minute. Okay, he does go for that move. I feel maybe the safest move in the position. Bring his knight to the side and hitting this black rook. Yeah, I, I have to say, um, I didn't see a good alternative, actually, yeah. for Magnus. I, I think this is the best uh, chance that he has. And I have to say that uh, I really do like the way that Eric has been handling this position with a lot, lot of grit and resilience. Yeah, I think maybe now is the time to trade queens. Uh, I don't really see what else. If you move the rook uh, that is attacked as black, then suddenly you have to worry about these pawns falling at some point. White can't take them yet, but some attacks here. White can maybe now dodge the trade of queens. And uh, I don't think that helps too much for black. So I think maybe just take the queens off the board, for example, pawn takes, and then just move the rook. You can even challenge white's rook. And suddenly Magnus's advantage is not so great because the knight's no longer on its ideal square in the middle. And also, uh, we mentioned this earlier, a long, long time ago, long term, this pawn is actually on a dart square. So black's bishop, not as bad as it looks. It does have one target in the position later. I was just thinking that when I was looking at this ending and I was thinking, I bet Magnus is thinking, why didn't I not just move my A pawn, push Alice one square, have her on a light square, the end. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, it's not a good idea to think about what happened in the game while the game is still not over, you know, that's another story. Of course, it's very hard to be organized and to not to let your thoughts go and back and think, why well, didn't I do this move or that move? This is what happens to anybody, I think. But one, I think, tip for our spectators, for our uh, followers, that it's good to finish the game and only after that to start thinking, what did you do wrong? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And we always see the players analyze the games as soon as they finish. <laughs> but during the games, especially someone like Magnus, he's good at just forgetting and just living in the moment. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, the only, it's the only moment when it's good to forget things, actually, right? <laughs> <laughs> just forget everything until the game is over. Yeah. 
No regrets, huh? <laughs> so everybody says that chess players need to have a good memory. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's the other way around. You should also be able to forget ah. things. <laughs> Selective memory. <laughs> okay, meanwhile, the position we actually predicted did arise. The Queen's got exchanged. Black's rook came to the fifth rank, actually defending everything. Black's bishop also um, kind of protecting that rook. And Magnus just teaming up his rooks together. And Eric now has a choice. Does he trade those rooks? Again, he's got to decide whether it's on his terms. He does, allowing White's rook into the game. I felt that was a bit too accommodating, actually, because mm. the only White benefit, benefited from that trade. I think it would have been much better to activate the other rook. And the tension. Yep. And now Black's bishop does have an opportunity to go and take that pawn. It has happened. We highlighted that pawn as a weakness, but Black's pawn falls as well. So still level material, but a double attack. White's rook hitting the bishop, of course, first but also the pawn, the black pawn in the centre of the board. Look Still, the Eric time. has some problems to deal with. Mm, look at the time, it's oh, 17 yeah. seconds. Oh, wow. Gosh, I Ooh, haven't realised. Talking about time trouble, less than 20 minutes left in the auction for David's chest high. Less than 20 minutes, the current bid, $500. So head into <laughs> cctauction.com and make your bid. All right, time trouble for Eric Hansen as well. Time trouble, and that's when mistakes happen, mm. and already we see the evaluation bar shoot off to white side. Black's bishop now is passive. It's gone to a bad square. <sighs> that bishop can be hit by the white rook, by the white pawn. It does feel like Magnus now has a couple of moves to create pressure before Black is able to get organised. What do we think? Is there a way to win a pawn here for White? Can White's rook go up the board to try and gobble up a pawn? <sighs> Again, it all comes back to that move 20 moves ago. Black's king in the corner. Just looks like a terrible piece in an endgame. And... Uh, Somehow Black's pawns in the centre of the board also a bit loose. We talk about advancing pawns. Sometimes they can be great, but you do leave weaknesses behind. And even in endgames now, these pawns don't necessarily defend each other. And Magnus going after Black's B-pawn. OK, we're actually going to see a similar scenario to the game between <laughs> Zhu Wenjun and Lei Ting Zhe. Black has given up a pawn, but he's going to try and seek solace in a rook endgame. You have to get rid of that white knight over the next couple of moves that white knight cannot be allowed to survive because then it will help white's extra C pawn forward. Mm. So white's a pawn up. Can Magnus convert it? Zhu Wenjun didn't manage to convert her extra C pawn in the last round. And uh, we'll okay. see if Magnus will be able yeah. to. Yeah, but Magnus has champions. a much better version of it because um, his rook can perhaps cut off the black king. And uh, I think Eric is choosing a different... He's maybe choosing to keep the rook <clears throat> I mean, take the rooks off and uh, keep the minor pieces on, which I'm not sure about, actually. OK, this is all about timing, because if Black's king can get across fast enough, the white knight is almost trapped, and the black king can even go for white's extra pawn, the white extra pawn blockaded by Black's bishop. But if the white knight is able to destabilise that black bishop, if the white king can get in, if the white pawn can push, it's just going to be game over. So, OK, really interesting. Maybe Eric's calculated this. Maybe he's OK. Uh, but... Uh, does feel like if Magnus is accurate, there must be something. But the but the White Knight has one safe escape route. It can yeah. relocate itself to I was going to say the C6 square and get out via the A line, but uh, he's chosen a different way. Yeah. So he hit the Black Bishop and the Black Pawn in the middle of the board. At least now the White Knight, very minimum, as you mentioned, Ivanka, uh, it does have an escape route. It can jump back to the B6 square and then back towards the centre. But. Uh, OK, I would be slightly reluctant to allow black's pawns all onto light squares as well, because if you look at the king side, the right side of the board, white's pawns are all on dark squares. That will mean the white king is tied down later if the black bishop tries to sneak in and attack those pawns. I think you have to maybe try and push some pawns to light squares at some point. But Magnus, OK, this is his uh, home territory, the end game, right? And uh, it would be a surprise if he doesn't win this one somehow. That being said, Eric, fighting. Fighting hard. Yes, and actually if he pushes his pawn forward, maybe the king can come closer at this moment, yes? Yeah, so if the black e-pawn can push forward... Uh, uh, I mean, if, if white pushes. Ah, the okay. c5 now. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe, maybe can... the king... Uh, yeah, yeah, after... Mm -hmm. So now he chose to move his king, but otherwise c5 w w would probably lose a pawn. Yeah. Okay, so white didn't take the risk of pushing the extra pawn forward because it might become weak, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, instead trying to activate the white king. But now I'm expecting Eric to lock things down. Uh, there we go. And the pawn structure on the king side now actually maybe favours black, uh, just because white's pawns are always going to be targets for the black bishop. Suddenly it feels to me like Eric's made some progress and Magnus hasn't really. Magnus has lost a lot of time with his knight. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I like what Eric's doing. You know, he's centralizing the bishop, but even more importantly, he's getting ready to run with the king to the C5 square and start looking up at the C4 pawn. So this is why uh, Magnus plays a crafty move, you know, puts his knight on the edge of the board. He says, no, you're not going to go for that plan. But it's not the most active knight I've ever seen. Yeah, White's knight <laughs> is definitely not the most centralized, not the most happy. Uh, but White's king is slowly going to snake its way over to support the White Knight, maybe retreating. And uh, there we go. Both kings doing a bit of a dance. But maybe big... Black has enough of uh, counterplay. Maybe he can start pushing his pawns mm. on the on the king's yep. sides, like yeah. very fast. <laughs> I think he should at some point. I would ideally want to put my pawns on light squares and do uh, do that. So, for example, Black could maybe push his h pawn forward two squares, blockade on the light squares, and use his bishop to trade pawns. Uh, but okay. He's actually trying to sneak around a different way. The black bishops has gone back. It wants to go to the a5 square to the side of the board and wants to sneak behind. Mm -hmm. If you could pick up that black bishop and put it behind white's pawns on the diagonal, on the dark square diagonal, all of white's pawns are going to drop. So that's really, really clever by Eric. He's going to use his bishop to tie down white's uh, king and knight to the protection of their kingside pawns. Yeah. Mm. I don't that's think Magnus point. is going to win this anymore. No, it's a beautiful idea from Eric. Really, it's very key, actually, to maintaining the defensive possibilities alive. Uh, I agree with you, David. I just don't see a way. Yeah, don't see a way forward. We have to show this because Eric's found a really, really nice idea. He's dropped his bishop back. It was on a great central square, but he's just trying to bring it to the side of the board, then in and behind, and look at all of White's pawns. They're just right for the picking. All of these pawns on dark squares, if the bishop does get behind, it's just going to be, if anything, winning for black. So White's king now has had to step back. But if the bishop just leaves itself on the side of the board, on this diagonal, hinting at later coming in, then the White king has to stay guarding this square. The White knight has to stop the, white, uh, the black king coming in. And how can White make progress? Maybe you can't. You can't. No. White is just completely frozen. This knight stopping the black king from coming forward. And uh, yeah, it just looks like an easy draw now for Eric. I think we're finding an answer, which are better. Uh, earlier I said good knight against bad bishop. This time it's the opposite. The bishop dominating the white knight. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the players. We might see a result shortly uh, if Eric can maybe hold his nerve and also make sure he plays quickly enough. Yes, he plays with 10 seconds all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as I was talking, I looked at the clock and <laughs> slightly panicked. 10 seconds or 15 seconds yes. every time Eric moves yeah. now. I don't know why he uses so much time. He just needs to make a good bishop move and uh, he has a whole board to make them. So, okay, so he's just centralizing the bishop. Okay, so Magnus, uh, he's been sneaky, you know. He's saying, well, maybe I'm going to do something with my king on the right side. You know, push a pawn forward. And uh, Eric says, no, mm -hmm. he's not going to go for that. Yep. Lock it down. Really nice strategy. Just pawns on the opposite colour of your bishop. The black bishop controls the dark squares. The pawns control the light squares. Uh, just one to remember at home. And the king coming back where it came from. <laughs> it, had, it found no joy on this side of the board. Uh, Magnus has all Two the time seconds. in the world. Oh, Eric doesn't have all the time in the world. Seconds. Two seconds. <laughs> But uh, yeah, unfortunately, still nothing for Eric. Uh, sorry, no way for Magnus to come through and not much to do for Eric either. He can just sit and wait. And there we go. The bishop just kind of yo-yoing back and forth between this square, the center, and Magnus can't really break through. If he starts pushing pawns, for example, white can push the F pawn forward. He only creates more weaknesses in his own camp. And Magnus has to maintain this kind of uh, blockade, this type of fortress with the white knight and pawn. And I think uh, Eric is just going to shuffle the bishop between those two squares. And no, but Magnus is going for it. He's making a pawn break. Okay, so he is trying. Anastasia mentioned it earlier. You've got to play endgames out to the end, right? Yes. yes right to the sure. final move, to king versus king. Yeah, on, but also he notices that his opponent is playing not so fast, let's say, and uh, only with seconds on his clock. So he, maybe he will be able to surprise his opponent at a certain point and then he can have chances. Yeah, and uh, okay, a trade of pawns. Magnus making a bit of a face though. Now Black's bishop can come to the center of the board. White's knight actually has no squares at all. I think his plan is to trade also G pawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Magnus has only one plan. He's got to push his pawns forward. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> literally he's, nothing else to do. He's a dog with his bone, you know. <laughs> but we know that all these trades are good for the weak side, right? I mean, yeah. We, we, let's exchange all the pawns and then but, we're fine. But even if you do exchange the, the pawns, so, if, so for instance, black 
holds the white king at bay. So for instance here, you don't take pawns and invite the king to step to the fourth row, you just hold the tension. What is Eric going to do? What is Magnus going to do? <laughs> Sorry, Mar Magnus, yeah, yeah, my apologies. Magnus has nothing to do, um, he just has to wait. But then again, okay, mm. I'm shocked by the evaluation bar. What is the idea behind this one? He's blocked things up completely. Now Eric has to just wait. Can white somehow get the king back into the game? Remember, white's knight has no safe squares. You can't push your extra pawn either for, uh, forward because then the black king comes towards the white knight. Okay, yeah. the white king tries to get in. It's denied. That's a check. It's kicked back. I think it was one trick. If, if Eric would move his bishop out of this diagonal, then knight could jump to c3 because e4 became a weakness. Mm. So actually, <laughs> there was the an plan. idea. <laughs> I think that's the plan anyway, because White's King is just going to sidestep now to the d2 square. White Knight's going to step back and, as you mentioned, Black's central pawn is actually isolated now. So maybe King, uh, King moves to d2 and then he supports the Knight, who will mm -hmm. jump to the square, to the only square, c3. Yeah, so White's Knight is going to get back to the game maybe eventually. I don't think that's going to change too much, because as soon as the White Knight steps away, the Black King will come down and pick off the White c pawn. But Magnus is trying. Yeah. He's at least trying to force Eric down under 10 seconds again. That's when blunders <laughs> might happen. Yeah. What a um, tense game, actually. Yeah. It is quite tense, especially because uh, Magnus will be taking a decision. Eric will have to be calculating at super speed in order to see what's the best defence for him. And, uh, you know, he's considering, does, should he put his bishop in the middle of the board? Should he try to go for something else? And so he's gone for the king move. Okay. Mm. Wow. Okay, so white might continue with the plan, but white's knight also has the opportunity at some point now to try and jump out of its cage from uh, on the edge of the board. It can jump forward. I don't think that really helps at the moment. I, uh, that's the first move I would calculate, actually, you know, yeah. because it's a consequence of black's last move. Okay, he jump, does it. Jump in with a knight, and uh, if that knight starts um, attacking some pawns on the right, they're going to fall. Uh, actually, maybe Magnus has a route to try and win Black's central pawn. I was worried here about Black's king stepping forward in front of White's extra pawn. Oh. There we go. And now White's knight can actually give a check. Uh, I don't think you want to go to any other square. You might get trapped. Or it can step back. Actually, wait, it's stepping towards the Black it's, G pawn. It, maybe yes. Magnus is winning suddenly. Yeah, yeah. Wow, we've seen Whoa. a turnaround. Wow. Eric has just Three, let the White knight back two. into the game. He played that move with less than one second left. Oh. And he's losing his pawns. Those pawns now, the G, black g6 pawn, it's fallen. Yeah. And yeah. those pawns are way more important than the pawns on the other side of the board. Black's kings are just not participating now. It's in no man's land. And uh, now he's got the best type of pawn. It's a, protect, it's a pass pawn. And, and he'll uh, win the bishop. He will win the bishop. Wow, we talked about squeezing water out of a stone. That has happened in this game. It was a, just a dead draw. Eric had it almost within his, uh, within his grasp. And here we go. Black's bishop has to stop the white pawn, but after this capture, that white pawn is going to cost Black his bishop. And Eric resigns. Magnus mm. squeezed out the win. Oh, wow. Both players shaking their heads. A little bit of a payback for Magnus Carlsen. He lost in the air, things, Masters. In this one, he was able to win against Eric Hansen. What